Thanks for inviting me to come out. Uh, this sounds like a pretty cool school, so I'm uh, honored to take part in it. Uh, my name's hello. My name's Nick Hutzler. I'm I'm an assistant professor of physics at Caltech. I'm an AMO experimentalist. Um, <clears throat> my work actually focuses mostly on precision measurement of fundamental physics using molecules. Although I won't actually I won't talk about that. I'll talk more about the the molecules side of that. Um, and uh, mostly an experimentalist, although starting at mid-March of 2020, we started doing some theory work. Um, this, is a, this is not a review, but I have many to suggest. If there is any particular area that you'd like to know more about, let me know, and I will, I will happily send you some, some suggested readings or put them in the, in the folder. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just down, well... For those of you who are local, I'm just down the road, so please come visit. Actually, even if you're not down the road, come visit any time um, or send me an email. And uh, please ask a lot of questions during this. And I, I encourage you not to preface your question with like, like, ah, this might be a stupid question or this might be a naive question, because it's not. It's a great question. Don't worry about it. Just ask it. We're here to ask questions. Great. <clears throat> so something uh, that I'll be talking about a lot today is photon cycling in molecules, uh, meaning the ability to repeatedly excite, uh, let spontaneously decay, and then re-excite some transition in a molecule. <clears throat> and the ability to do this many times is very useful. Um, it allows you to uh, do efficient state control through optical pumping. Um, it allows you to detect efficiently if you detect these decay photons. If you can scatter enough of these uh, photons, you can actually do things, you can like apply forces, including you can do things like cooling and trapping uh, using laser light. And uh, this ability to scatter many photons is a very critical ingredient in, well, let's say, like ultra coherent atomic experiments. So people making like atom array quantum simulators and quantum computers and quantum gas microscopes and things. Um, they, they use this ability to scatter many photons uh, extensively. There's, and this is great, uh, except you know, nothing, nothing looks like this. There's always some other state that this excited state can, can leak to. And that's a problem because if this excited state goes here and you don't have a laser here, or you don't have a laser here to address it, then it's lost. You're not going to scatter any more photons off it. So your detection or your cooling or your state preparation or something will just stop. So that's fine if if there's, say, only a loss to one state or two states or something, you can just add a second laser. And this is the case for many, many atoms where people do things like this. You often have to have two lasers or maybe three um, or sometimes one, but never, never that many. Uh, however, molecules, because they have such complicated and rich internal structure, they, th they do things like rotate and vibrate, which atoms do not. That adds a very large number of potential leakage channels. And so getting, if you want to do this in a molecule, you have to get this under control, or at least figure out what to do about it. It turns out um, that, I'll talk about all the different things that go into this, but it turns out that the molecular vibration is actually the kind of trickiest feature of molecules that makes this hard. <clears throat> So I'll start by talking about the vibronic structure, meaning the sort of vibrational and electronic structure um, of molecules that gives you this ability to cycle photons. A lot of the experts in this stuff, by the way, are at this winter school. So um, there are people who know more about this stuff in the room than I do, but that's OK. Um, <clears throat> So what do you need to do? If you want to do something like this, um, there's sort of an intuitive understanding uh, of what you need to look for in molecular structure or what you want to design that I'll talk about in more detail. But in some sense, you need to find molecules where the valence electrons don't participate in the chemical bond, meaning um, that the excitation won't change the chemical bond because there's some uncoupling between the electronic and vibrational degrees of freedom. So I'll give you an example of like a bad molecule, a molecule where this is unlikely to work. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, calcium oxide. Calcium has two valence electrons. Oxygen wants two. All the electrons are involved in the bond. And so if you excite one of these electrons with a laser, um, you will change uh, the chemical bond quite a bit. And you'll sort of give the vibration a kick, and it can start vibrating. So <clears throat> uh, you know, more rigorously, you know, these potential energy surfaces don't overlap between these ground and excited states. And a molecule that's great is calcium fluoride. Only one electron participates in the bond. This other electron sort of stays centered around the metal. And so whether you excite this electron or not, the molecular bond, the molecular degrees of freedom, don't care. Too good approximation. <clears throat> uh, and so when you excite that electron, the molecular properties don't really change very much. It's sort of like an electron just sort of hanging around this, this molecule. And this, by the way, if instead of this molecule actually does have this structure. It's more complicated than the dots, and we'll talk about it. Um, but it turns out this also works if instead of something like fluorine, you have something that bonds like fluorine, like OH. So calcium fluoride, if you do something more sophisticated than you know, draw the dots um, and do, say, like an ab initio calculation, like what's done here, um, <clears throat> you find that uh, this kind of Lewis dot structure sort of represents what the, what the orbitals look like. Here in the ground state of calcium fluoride, um, <clears throat> you get one, one electron is sort of in this chemical bond. It's sort of very deeply bound. Uh, and this valence electron, it turns out, is really kind of centered around this calcium. It, it, sort of, it largely avoids the fluorine. Um, <clears throat> and so thinking about this as really a sort of like a metal-centered electron is a fairly valid picture um, for these types of molecules. So the ground state, in some sense, it looks like a, uh, a single S-like electron stuck on this calcium um, with some important caveats that, that I'll discuss. And uh, it turns out that this structure is very similar for chemically similar species with chemically similar metals, so alkaline earths. Calcium, strontium, barium, radium also look like this. Uh, Ytterbium and mercury, it turns out, also because they have a similar valence structure to the alkaline earths, they also look like this. <clears throat> and uh, I'll talk about this type of molecule. Um, and in the community, we call these, these sorts of things optical cycling centers. So this is an optical cycling center in the, in the calcium fluoride molecule, <clears throat> or OCC. So that's sort of the, what I'll be talking about. Are there any, any questions so far? By saying that the ground state has an S-like electron, do you mean like homo orbital? Uh, I mean, yeah, so I'll actually, I'll show some, I'll show some like energy level diagrams of this molecule later. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so these, uh, these are the atoms in the periodic table that have an S squared valence, S2 valence configuration. So there's the alkaline earths, um, ytterbium, nobelium, which is not really practical. Um, and then these, you know, zinc, cadmium, and mercury. Um, so basically, things at the end of some block in the periodic table um, have this structure, uh, and these metals uh, tend to make these types of molecules the cycling centers, although some of these have more caveats than others. Yeah? Do we know for sure, like, so for example, some of the F block in the middle of them, they'll, you know, you'll pull down that D electron to half fill the F block and so you have an S2 configuration. Has, has everyone explored all of the... And in the D block, too, there's also half-filled valencies that. Yeah, some of them. So I don't know about systematically, but uh, in my group, we looked at some of the things in the middle of the F block. Um, <clears throat> and they didn't, they didn't work very well. Um, but it, as far as I know, nobody has done that. And we also did, because I remember like we did manganese, for example, on the computer 
pewter. Um, and we did some of these in the middle here. Um, I think we did europium. And uh, the half-filled shell tended to just do a lot of complicated things to the structure. And a lot of these also don't have, uh, they don't have like a doublet sigma type ground state, which is kind of the, not necessarily a deal breaker, but makes it all really complicated. Yeah. Good question, though. I asked a lot question, why do you want a doublet ground state? Oh, uh, you don't necessarily want one, but I will talk about why those are useful later. But in some sense, it's sort of the simplest, simplest ground state. Because all of these, when you have, when you have higher spins, you get more substructure. Um, and that substructure make things, makes things increasingly complicated. But also, if you, have higher, if you have higher spin, it means you have multiple electrons. And you don't get this necessarily this kind of single electron picture um, that I will talk about in more detail here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that's kind of a, there are, whether there are things that can reasonably cycle photons in sort of the middle of these, especially here and here, that's a good question. I think for, for, for the P block, this is something that we have systematically looked at. And I will possibly talk about that if I have time. Um, that one turns out to be kind of more tractable, but things in the middle here and things in the middle here are, are very messy. These are great questions. Any other questions? Um, just as a heuristic, <coughs> would you say that you need a doublet uh, sigma type gun state to minimize the chance of transitioning to other states when you are doing the cycling? So the, that to yeah, so at least for, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but <clears throat> you get a sigma state in this or in molecules, in certain, in these alkaline earth fluorides, for example, um, where you have a single S electron when you get the, on the metal, when there's bonding with the fluorine, you get mixing of some p-type character, which polarizes the electron away from the bond. Um, that's not the only way to get that, um, but that appears to be the most efficient way to get that, while still maintaining like a strong electronic transition. But there are excited states, so <clears throat> uh, in these, again, I'll, I'll show some level diagrams later. In these excited states, the excited electronic states are not all sigma, they're like pi states and delta states, and they also tend to avoid the bonding region. They are also polarized away. Um, but these types, you usually in the ground state have molecules prefer to be in sigma states. So there are some proposed optical cycling candidates that have like pi or delta ground states, but those are just sort of not as common just because they, they prefer to be sigma yeah, when they have like a few electrons. These are great questions. For a dumb question, but ah. I don't know. I pr what probably is, not. Tell you what, if anyone asks a dumb question, I'll let you know. I'll be like, that question is really dumb. <laughs> so what, is, what is sigma? What is delta? I am not. I will, I'll get there. Yeah. So don't worry. If, if you're lost by what um, I'm talking about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review all these things. So I'm not assuming that you know what I'm like, ah, sigmas and pis. And I'll, ta I'll, I'll talk about all that. I just don't want to keep the, I don't want to keep people waiting, you know. <clears throat> um, yeah, any other, any other questions? All right. So uh, molecular structure, if you've never worked with it in detail, it's a, it's a total mess. Um, but luckily, um, we will be looking at sort of simple ones where you actually can sort of intuitively understand the structure and like write it down and kind of fully understand all the degrees of freedom um, without having to use a Hamiltonian with this many terms. Um, this, by the way, this is, you know, this is, so Brown and Carrington for people who work in molecules is sort of like one of the Bibles, but it's also a good reference if you want to show people like very intimidating formulas which, because this is like, this is all one formula. This is, this is 3.297 in Brown and Carrington. And it like occupies several pages. 
and this is the Hamiltonian for diatomic molecules, ignoring relativity and assuming no nuclear spins. So like, it's very complicated. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but yeah, don't worry about this. We're gonna, we're gonna build up an intuitive picture of what's going on, which for these types of simple molecules is actually, uh, it's very valid in addition to being very useful. Um, <clears throat> So we can start just to introduce some of the ideas and the terminology. Um, we can start by looking at the rigid H2 plus ion. So assume you have two protons at a fixed distance and you have one electron orbiting that. That's sort of like the simplest molecule in some sense. Um, that problem is analytically solvable. We won't go through that. We'll just kind of talk about what the solution is. Um, but uh, it's one of the few quantum mechanical systems which is like exactly analytically solvable. <clears throat> uh, so you don't have, one of the biggest difference or maybe the biggest difference compared to atoms um, is that you don't have spherical symmetry anymore. It's not a central potential. You have cylindrical symmetry but you don't have spherical symmetry anymore. Um, <clears throat> so the orbital angular uh, momentum, you know, L for the electron for this electron orbiting this molecule, um, that's not a good quantum number anymore. Uh, however, because you, you still have this cylindrical symmetry, the projection of L on the internuclear axis is a good quantum number. Um, and we, we label that as uh, L, uh, or lambda. Lambda is the projection of L on N, which is the internuclear axis. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, I'm just gonna state these things without proof. And if you're interested, in, oh, actually this, this book, among many others, goes through rigorously solving all this. Um, you can just trust me though. <clears throat> uh, so this orbital angular momentum projection on this axis um, gives you the phi part, the sort of azimuthal angle around this axis. The phi part of the wave function is e to the i lambda phi. It's very simple. It's very, it's, exactly analogous to the phi part if, you've, if you have memorized all the spherical harmonics, uh, that the phi part is always e to the i m phi. And it's for the same reason um, that, uh, in the, that the, the Hamiltonian term containing phi is basically just d by d phi. Um, so the phi part of the wave function is very simple. It's e to the i lambda phi. Um, <clears throat> and because uh, this orbiting uh, uh, electron makes a magnetic field, um, there's some internal magnetic, this is all very hand wavy again, there's some internal magnetic field along this direction and so that quantizes the spin uh, along this direction. That's sort of a, another way to think about why, um, you know, why this is a good quantum number, why these are reasonable eigenstates to work with. <clears throat> and so the states uh, in this molecule are labeled by uh, N L lambda, N is the, is the principal quantum number, just like in atoms. Um, L is the orbital angular momentum uh, of the electron, which you label as S, P, D, et cetera, just like in an atom. And then lambda, uh, which is the projection of L on this internuclear axis, you label with lowercase Greek letters, but in the same alphabetical order, so like sigma, pi, delta, et cetera. So does lambda play the same role as like Z direction spin? Like the N quantum number? Yes, it's except it's with the important distinction that it's the M in the molecular frame. So like M, the projection of, of all the angular momenta on the lab frame is still a good quantum number. Um, this is a projection of the angular momentum on the internal molecular frame. And that's sort of a, that's a key difference between atoms and molecules because atoms don't have an internal frame, but molecules do. But yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very similar in many respects. So it's like M, it's like M in the molecule frame. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a kind of a problem, not really a problem, an observation, which is that uh, these wave functions, uh, they form some basis for the solutions. Um, but they're not eigenstates of parity or time reversal symmetry. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Not much more about that later. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
the physical eigenstates are, are superpositions of these two. Um, for example, you know, e to the i lambda phi plus or minus e to the uh, minus i lambda phi. So the two states, e to the plus or minus i lambda phi, are not, not the physical eigenstates. Their superpositions are. So, and those look like cosine and sine of lambda phi. And in particular, that means that they have nodal planes. Because remember, phi is the like azimuthal angle. So there are angles where the wave function goes to 0, and there are lambda of them. <clears throat> so if you look up, uh, you can look up again in you know, this book or many, many others. Um, you can see, like, what do these orbitals look like? Because um, I, I sort of listed them earlier. Like, they look, you know, here are their numbers. Here's what they, here at least a few of them look like. So 1 s sigma is just some kind of maximally symmetric uh, wave function. But then if you have, for example, uh, something like 2 p pi, this pi means lambda equals 1. That means the eigenstates of this electron moving around uh, this azimuthal angle look like cosine or sine of theta. And so that means you get sort of two, two perpendicular states that are rotations of each other where there's some nodal plane. And uh, those are double, those are nominally degenerate, sort of what, what difference does it make whether the lobe is like up or down? But it turns out they're not actually degenerate. So, I'll, and I, I will revisit this later. Right, so can I ask, you mentioned that these are not time reversal symmetric states. So does that mean that the two magnetic sublevels of the doublet is going to be split? The two magnetic sublevels yeah, of, yeah. of which doublet? Of the single electron, which will be the doublet as a result. Yeah, well, so it turns out that those, um, these two, these two states, the actual physical eigenstates are split even in the absence of a magnetic field. Yeah, but the spin states, I mean, because the spin states, if I imagine they're not time universal symmetric. Oh, bring chimeras, so yeah, so I haven't, I haven't written anything about the spin states here. But yes, if you have, if you have one valence, you know, S type, or I guess one valence electron in any state, uh, it will have like a first order magnetic sensitivity. Yeah. <clears throat> so that, but I'm that the spin degree of freedom so far, I'm just, I'm ignoring. But, uh, but yeah, that will, that will give rise to a first order Zeeman shift. So these are the orbitals. Uh, these, these are, are the orbitals. These are the, yeah, these are the like electron position space orbitals. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm confused about uh, why the um, states are not the eigenstates <clears throat> of uh, parity operator because we always study that parity operator commutes with L square and L square commutes with H. So all of them should be the eigenstates of uh, like uh, the E bar I yeah. and phi should be an eigenstate. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So I, I will say more about why these are not like what lifts this degeneracy later. But to that end... It's in the, the connecting it to like commuting with L squared and uh, whatnot. Um, this there's no more spherical symmetry in this problem. I think a lot of those arguments rely on sphere uh, on spherical symmetry. Um, in this case, you don't have spherical symmetry. You only have uh, sy cylindrical symmetry. So um, you don't get so spherical symmetry is what gives you the sort of overall quantum. You know, overall L being a good quantum number, and then cylindrical symmetry gives you the projection being a good quantum number. Here you only have the projection being a good quantum number. So you only have uh, the, so you only get this projection lambda as your good quantum number. Yeah. Uh, for 2s sigma, don't you have a radial nor like node plane or not? Should it be look like a 2s or, <coughs> or? Yeah, that's this black line, I guess. Yeah. Maybe the colors. I think, yeah, I think the colors didn't really come through. I think, yeah, because I think this this should be some other color here. You can actually, if you if you look at it this close, you can see it's like a very light gray. So that was sort of unfortunate. Um, but yeah, so this has this black line is like a node, a nodal surface, and same with this. So there's over here, there, yeah. So the, the wave function is symmetric around. Right? It's not like it's on one half. Um, yeah, so. Good observation. Yeah, you can actually you can see it on my screen. It's just the projector's kind of washing it out. But good, yeah, good catch. But just to make sure I understand this, um, so are these wave functions stationary states or are they like the time dependent states? 
Uh, <clears throat> these, these are the stationary states. Yeah, so the, um, these states would not be stationary states, it turns out. Um, but these ones, these are the stationary states. But because you take linear combination, so the time cancels out, something like that? I, 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 yeah. Uh, there, so these, these states, do you mean like specifically for these? Yeah, like why are, yeah. why are the ones on top not stationary, uh, stationary, not stationary states, but the ones at the bottom of it? <laughs> yeah, so um, this is something that I'll, I'll talk more in detail about later, but it, it, it boils down to the fact that these two states are split in energy, meaning that, that these are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and therefore the stationary states, um, and these are superpositions of these. And so that means that these are not these are not stationary states, right? Because these, if these are the because for, for reasons I will will get to later, but for now, if you just if you believe me, that these are the stationary states, um, and they are not degenerate, and they're superpositions of these. That means these can't be the stationary states, because these are you could think of these as being superpositions of these, but these have different energy. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Keep them coming. These are these are all really good questions. Well, what is the difference between the colors? I mean, like between what? The colors. I mean, like the blue one and the right. Yes, and the the light gray that you can't see. Um, that would be the like the signs of the wave function. So, <clears throat> um, so for example, there's a you can't see it, but there's an equivalent lobe here. And if you if you took like the square of the wave function. It would be symmetric around this direction, but this lobe has opposite sign compared to that lobe. And uh, so, yeah. And the line is zero. The line is zero. Yeah, the line is a, a nodal plane or a nodal or a nodal surface. Yeah. Any other questions? Ah, <clears throat> uh, so next. More letters and more Greek letters. Um, <clears throat> if you're familiar with how you sort of build up levels in atoms, for molecules you do the same thing. Um, if you're not familiar um, with, with how to do that, if you have multiple electrons, so this was all just like one electron. If you have multiple electrons, um, you basically add up all the individual quantum numbers. Um, it's not obvious why that works, and it doesn't always work, but it turns out it usually works, um, especially for light things. Um, so just you get a total L, which is the sum of all the individual electron Ls, you know, the, their orbital angular momentum. You add up all their spins. Um, <clears throat> so you get some total capital L and total capital S, which you get from adding up the lowercase things. And then you get some total J, which is L plus S. Um, and then you also get a total lambda, which is capital. Uh, you get a total capital lambda, which is basically the projection of all the electron orbital angular momentum, add them together, project them on internuclear axis. So that gives you uh, lambda. <clears throat> and then you also get some quantum number called omega, which is the total J, including L and S, added together, projected on the internuclear axis. <clears throat> And then, uh, similar to the atomic term symbol, uh, you know, like the triplet P1 and that sort of thing, you can get, you can define the analogous term symbol for molecules, which describes their states, um, where you write 2s plus 1, where this is the total s in a sub superscript. You put omega in the subscript. And then for this capital lambda, you write capital sigma or pi or delta instead of lowercase for the single electron orbitals. Um, <clears throat> we won't need, if you haven't memorized all this, that's okay, because we're really only going to be talking about like one or two types of states. Um, we are interested in a single metal-centered S-type electron, so that simplifies a lot. We just have one single electron, so S is a half, so you get, you know, a doublet up here. Um, we get an S, we're looking at like S-type electrons at least most of the time, so there's no L, so Lambda is zero, so it's a sigma state. So we get, so it's a doublet sigma state. Um, and you usually, I guess technically it's doublet sigma one half, but you usually omit this subscript because it's redundant in this case. 
Um, <clears throat> so doublet sigma basically means I have a single S-type electron. Or I have a single S-type electron means doublet sigma. Doublet sigmas can also arise from other things, but um, never mind that. <clears throat> so that's what this, um, this like sigma and pi and things, they're basically labeling the electron states in these molecules. <clears throat> and then uh, the last piece of convention to introduce is that um, electronic states uh, are labeled by letters. So we don't index them with numbers like you do in an atom. Uh, you index them with a letter. The ground state is always X for just conventional reasons. And then the excited states or excited electronic states are A, B, C, et cetera, in alphabetical order. Usually, it's actually the order in which they were discovered um, or predicted, which for if you look at mole like old molecules that people have been studying for a long time, um, the, lab the labeling is very random, like thorium oxide, which is one of my favorite molecules. It doesn't go X, A, B, C. It goes X, H, Q, W, K prime. Though then there's the A, then a B, then H prime, M prime, C. It's just like, because they were kind of discovering, they discovered them in that order. So whatever. But for the molecules I'll talk about, they actually have a reasonably consistent labeling. X, X is always the ground state. That's the only strict rule. Then what's the first excited state's letter? It's like it's usually A, but like sometimes it's sure, H. Right, okay. like here, yeah, so H in thorium octet is actually the lowest electronic excited state. And then, and then Q and then W, of course. Yeah. Obviously. There's some very interesting molecular structure reasons for why they were discovered in that order, but you know, talk to me about that later. Um, can the ground state be degenerate? Yes, it can. Um, it can be, so I, uh, meaning like a non-sigma state, is that what you mean? Or, or degenerate, in, I guess it can, be, it can be degenerate in any sense of the word. It can have spin degeneracies, it can have like orbital angular momentum degeneracies. None of these degeneracies are like actually degenerate. You know, nothing, it, they're always kind of lifted by something. But yeah, the ground state um, doesn't have to just be like sort of one state. It can have fine structure and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even for the molecules that I'll talk about, there's like substructure in the ground state, like fine structure and hyperfine structure that, that I will discuss. When would the uniqueness of the ground state apply? Huh? Like, it's usually an assumption we start with, with like, um, I think it it kind of in some sense depends what you what you mean by ground state. I think if you if you define ground state as like the lowest bound level, then then it is unique, um, barring some like accidental degeneracy, which I would argue never exists because you only get actual degeneracies when you have like a symmetry protecting something. Um, and so you can, for example, you can have like different Zeeman sublevels of something that are degenerate. Um, <clears throat> uh, but those are basically just the same state, but with the spin reoriented or something. States that are sort of distinct in some meaningful way, but exactly degenerate, I think you could argue on pretty general terms, simply do not exist. But in principle, they could. You know, you could, you could concoct, like on paper, you could concoct something where all the couplings, like if you had a pi state and you, you know, you could concoct some scheme so that the two spin orbit components are exactly degenerate because of a bunch of like fine tuned cancellations. But um, I think such things do not exist in nature. Yeah. If they come up in very phase. So when you have these unique points in Hamiltonian where you have exact generacies in, in non trivial electronic structure problems, that's a special case where you have very phase that pops up. So you can look into that. Yeah, and so you can, you can tune things to degeneracy in, uh, in molecules, um, but it's usually not the ground state in free space. I guess I should, I should be clear. I mean, like, the, ground, the lowest energy state, and I'm talking about the, when I talk about ground state, I mean, like, in free space. You can engineer things where there are interactions to make the ground state actually degenerate. Um, and I'll actually kind of talk about something like that later. But yeah, for, like, free space things, there are no... I would argue there are no accidental, non-trivial degeneracies. Yeah. 
Any other questions? <coughs> All right, so we're, th we're looking at things that look you know, very roughly like this. We have some metal, like a metal with two S electrons. We sort of take one away because it's bonded um, to the fluorine or something. And so you can, just in terms of understanding the structure, a starting point is just like, what, is the positive, what are the positive ions energy levels? It's just a single S electron. It's just some sort of ladder of hydrogenic uh, energy levels, so they're labeled, you know, there's S and P's and there's N's, the principal quantum number. Um, so this is just basically like an alkali atom energy level structure. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, that's, we, and then now we can start adding features to sort of back out what the real actual structure looks like. It's not so simple that the molecular structure just looks like this. Um, <clears throat> so the dominant Perturbation, in some sense, is the fact that uh, this, this ligand is there, and it has a charge, and so it creates an electric field sort of pointing along the internuclear axis in some sense. So uh, what does that do? Now we add a big, basically add a big electric field um, to this alkali-like structure. So this will do sort of three things. Um, well, it'll do more than three things, but... It'll do at least three things. The first is it'll just, it, first it'll just shift the energy levels just from the Stark effect. You add an electric field, the levels will shift around. Okay, so they'll shift around. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next thing that will happen is you'll split states um, by lambda. So here, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you still have sol spherical symmetry, then these lambda states would all be degenerate. But now once you add an electric field, you break spherical symmetry, you only have cylindrical symmetry, you'll split the levels by different lambda. Lambda is the projection of L on the internuclear axis, which is the direction of this electric field. <clears throat> so now, um, okay, so the, you know, that one doesn't do much. Well, it shifts again, but then you know, this, this D state, for example, shifts into like a D sigma and a D pi and a D delta and the P splits into a P pi and a P sigma, et cetera. So you, they kind of all, spread apart and you get a lot more complexity. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, finally, um, you don't just split these states by different uh, lambda. The electric field can also mix states of the same, that have the same, val the same lambda. Lambda is preserved by this electric field along this direction. So it's a good quantum number, but you can have, <clears throat> so it's a good quantum number. And remember I said that like, the overall L wasn't, so like S and P and stuff is not a good quantum number, but lambda is, that means you can get, and you do generally get mixtures of states that have the same lambda, uh, but different, you know, L, different SPD. So for example, you know, this, this state is actually some mixture of some D pi and some P pi, and like this state uh, is some mixture of some P pi, some, uh, some P sigma and some D sigma, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> But at the end of the day, the actual like physical eigenstates that you get in the actual molecule uh, look, or in these types of actual molecules, look like this. You get this ground state, which is a sigma state, which arises from this type of orbital, and then you get some spectrum of excited states. The one that I'll talk about most is this one, which is usually but not always the lowest electronic excited state, which is some mixture of you know some uh, pi, t you know some d and P, pi type orbitals, et cetera. Yeah. So when you mix two states, you should get two states. Where are the others? <clears throat> They're not degenerate, I assume. Sorry, when you mix which two states? So you show two states being mixed. Oh, here? Pi, but ah, where's the other one? That's a great question. Um, we'll come back to that because there, um, you get two state, you get sort of like a, you get two lobes, just like with P orbitals, you get like multiple lobes. With these pi states, you sort of have like two perpendicular lobes, uh, which are nominally degenerate, but they're not actually degenerate because nothing's actually degenerate. And uh, I'll actually show some pictures of those later um, <clears throat> because uh, those states can be, uh, for a nonlinear or slightly nonlinear molecule, those states can actually be pushed really far apart. Um, but yeah, that's right. This is actually like there's this, there's a sort of twofold 
degeneracy, and this is that same sort of lambda twofold degeneracy that I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> you know, sort of lambda uh, one direction or the other. You know, is it sort of cosine phi or sine phi? But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say more about that later. Uh, could you yeah. remind, remind me again about the, what specifically lambda is? Yeah, lambda is the projection. So yeah, lowercase lambda um, is the projection of uh, a single electron's orbital angular momentum on this on the internuclear axis. And then capital lambda is basically the sum of all the individual electrons, which for these, uh, for these molecules where you, where you have like a single valence S electron, you can, re you can think of it just like with a, an alkali atom or a hydrogenic atom, you can think of it as uh, sort of a single valence electron on top of some filled core, which pushes the levels around a lot, but sort of doesn't change this, you know, the, the, the gross structure in some sense. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. In your notation on the next slide, what does the tilde sign on the, on the top of the... Ah, yeah. yeah. So s strictly speaking, um, only diatomics have this like alphabetical without a tilde label. You have an you you put the tilde on it if it's not a diatomic. Although, and also for <laughs> this labeling scheme also completely breaks down for like nonlinear things. So technically the tilde is when it's polyatomic but linear. Um, yeah. So I would I would don't worry about the tilde. In fact, I think like when I write papers and stuff, I think I usually don't include the tilde just because it's like they basically look like diatomics. Like eh. But um, yeah, there's a the the notation to keep track of all this stuff is is like astoundingly complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the tilde is just labeling. It's not. It does it has no kind of physical significance. So it means that we're looking at the like more than two atoms, but linear molecule, right? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so, and if you, you know, you can make a, uh, uh, let's see, I think it just needed to be, there we go, I just had to power cycle it. Um, <clears throat> so you can make, you know, tables, for example, looking, uh, you know, a little more rigorously, of, you know, what kind of states do you mix together to get these various excited, in the excited state, or the ground state and the excited state spectrum. Um, <clears throat> and you can, you know, calculate the various contributions and things, but, um, we won't need a, that level of, of detail for what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> but this is, this is actually great because, you know, the, once you look at what these orbitals look like uh, and, how, and study how they interact with the sort of chemical degrees of freedom, you recover this nice intuitive picture that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I, yeah, this should just this should probably say photon cycling, electronic structure for photon cycling. But um, uh, so in these, like for example, in this ground state, you get some a mixture of like an S and a P sigma uh, type orbital, and so you know S kind of looks like this, and P sigma kind of looks like that. And when you add these together, you get something where the bond is pushed away, or the electron is like pushed away from the bonding region. It's like repelled by the bond. Um, and, uh, you know, more, you know, this is an actual, this is a PowerPoint drawing. This is an actual calculation um, <clears throat> uh, from this paper here um, that Anna's group put out a few years ago. Um, and uh, you see that this, it, there really is this kind of dimple around the bonding region. Like the electron wave function really avoids the bonding region. Um, <clears throat> so in some sense, uh, the valence electron is not involved in the bond and, and you get, or it's, not very involved in the bond. Um, and so you get this decoupling of electronic structure and molecular degrees of freedom, which is kind of what you want in some, for this at least. <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned, and we'll say a little bit more, you know, we've, we've mostly been talking about the metal. We've, we haven't really been talking about the ligand other than it's like it bonds and it makes some ligand field. Um, and so as long as this is something that looks similarly like fluorine or, uh, 
a pseudo halogen like OH or CCH or something, this picture is still fairly valid, but with some you know, increasing levels of complication. <clears throat> and uh, so this, this motif, at least for, sort of, for like gas phase small molecules, um, is what's been used for all uh, experimental demonstrations of photon cycling so far. Um, this sort of single S-type electron. Um, <clears throat> and also this is the motif that has been studied most thoroughly. Although there are some other, there are things that don't necessarily look like this, which also cycle photons. Um, this is kind of the, the dominant paradigm, yeah. On your P sigma orbital, why is the brown lobe away from the bar? Yeah, so, um, so this, if you had, if you, that's a good question. Um, and I would imagine it's because if you, if you say flipped this over, this would be a much, much higher energy. And so, um, so maybe that is a perfectly valid state, but it's like really high in energy. I don't know, I'll open that up to the room because I actually, that's a, that would be the way I would answer it. I don't know if that's correct. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this, this is just for this particular state. You know, there are other states that don't look like this. Yeah. <clears throat> and that would be probably a very bad state for photon cycling because it would have gigantic coupling between the electron and the bond. And yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so, you, so I think this kind of the parallels between these atoms, or between these molecules and alkali atoms is, you know, it's, it's more than superficial. You know, the ground state um, is kind of some, given the symmetries, maximally symmetric thing. Um, the excited state looks kind of similar, but with a lobe down the middle. So this is what the alkali atom wave functions look like. This is what these, uh, you know, alkaline earth fluoride, calcium fluoride, um, et cetera, molecules look like. And it's like, eh, they look kind of similar. Um, but they also have, um, they have strong opt optical excitations at kind of similar-ish wavelengths, meaning just a few EV, so like visible to near IR. Um, and they have, you know, 10, 10 to tens of nanosecond radiative decay lifetimes. Again, this is all typically. Um, so they have a lot of the, a lot of the features uh, that make alkali atoms so widely used um, for photon cycling and laser cooling and, uh, you know, quantum control things, you, you inherit a lot of those with these molecules as well, although with lots of complexity. <clears throat> Just uh, as an aside, um, I, I'll mostly talk about these sort of single S electron, you know, doublet sigma ground state type molecules. There is another very similar category um, of closed shell species like aluminum fluoride and aluminum chloride. Um, <clears throat> these are very, very similar, except they have two valence electrons in this orbital instead of one. So you get very similar looking orbitals, but now you have two because the aluminum has like a uh, S2P1 configuration. So then when it bonds the fluorine, the P electron more or less goes away and you end up with sort of two of these metal centered S electrons. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's very similar in terms of this kind of vibrational electronic interaction picture that I've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> though practically there are some big differences. Now you're dealing with singlets and triplets instead of doublets. So things like transition probabilities and strengths and magnetic sensitivities and hyperfine structure are all very different. Um, <clears throat> but at least from this picture they're very they're similar. Also they t these molecules have very UV wavelengths. So they're just they're they're hard to work with experimentally. Um, but there are several groups pursuing these aluminum molecules for photon cycling and quantum control. Are the Franconian factors all worse because there's a bit of covalency there? <clears throat> They're actually better. Aluminum, fluor aluminum fluoride is possibly, according to theory and I think what experimental data there is on it, is like the most diagonal molecule. I guess what you, there is a balance of a bit more covalency, but on the other hand, much larger size. And so you don't overlap as well, something like that. Too.
Yeah, maybe. And that, I, and I, I don't know if there's a good um, understanding of like why it's sort of better. I think it, it might have something to do with the fact that just it's, it's lighter. That's not, that doesn't entirely explain it, but like the, like magnesium and beryllium molecules are also predicted to be like very diagonal. Um, and also have, they have the, the doublet structure, but they're also very UV, so they're just kind of hard to work with. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> um, and maybe it's like a polarization. Yeah, I don't know if there's a good, I'm, I'm sure there is a very good intuitive understanding of like why when you go down the periodic table, they sometimes tend to get worse, um, the, meaning less diagonal. Some, there are some reversals, which I'll talk about later, like radium is a reversal where it gets worse, 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 and then much better. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I don't know if, I'm sure there is kind of a, a, a sort of a chemically motivated intuitive argument for why these are like super diagonal. I think these are so diagonal, you basically don't need repump lasers to, cool, to laser cool them. They're, they're shockingly diagonal. Oh, yeah, great question. I will talk about that later. By diagonal, I mean there's a very strong decoupling of the electronic and vibrational degrees of freedom. Why do I call that diagonal? I'll, I'll get to that later. You know, it's, um, it's, actually, it's something about the probability of decays to, between different states. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but when I say diagonal, which I'll, I'll define fairly soon. I should have defined it earlier, I guess. Although I don't think it's appeared in the slides yet. Um, by diagonal, I just mean it has this decoupling of electronic and uh, vibrational degrees of freedom. I'll ask a very, okay, ah. just a question. Yeah. So you said that those, uh, like for, for example, calcium fluoride it behaves like a, like an alkali atom, right? Uh, spectroscopically. Ish, yeah. Uh, why don't just use atoms? Why do we need diatomic? That's a great question. Um, and that's a, that's a question that, that keeps me up at night that a lot of people ask me. Um, yeah, so, and I actually, I won't talk, I won't talk too much about why. Um, but the short, I think the short version is for the type of research that I do, um, I rely on the fact that molecules have internal electromagnetic fields, whereas atoms don't. And I, in my lab, we study the effect of the, of those strong electromagnetic fields on the nuclei and the electrons, um, to look for symmetry violating electromagnetic interactions that would come from like beyond standard model physics. And those forces are basically absent. They're not basically absent. They're, they're like a thousand times smaller in atoms than in molecules. So you get sort of a thousand times intrinsic sensitivity gain if you work with a molecule versus an atom. And it turns out to be like worth it in terms of the complexity trade-off. Um, another reason is that I would say from the chemistry standpoint, molecules are, have more interesting chemistry than atoms. Like atoms have very interesting chemistry. Um, <clears throat> but if you want to say like study like bonds breaking and forming and things like that, you kind of have to use molecules. Um, people have done a lot of very exciting like ultra gold chemistry with atoms. Um, but ultra gold chemistry with molecules is like, you know, some, it's like, ah, oh, wow, that's where it gets, starts to get really, really interesting. So that's kind of another motivation. Um, if if yeah. an atom doesn't interact with anything, is it chemistry? <laughs> hmm? if, if an atom is, is not interacting with anybody, is that even chemistry? I don't know, maybe. Um, I mean, you can like, you know, you can make them, you can sort of turn them into molecules and things like that. But yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, the real interesting chemistry is, is with molecules, in my opinion. So that's one of the, re another reason um, <clears throat> is, which uh, I guess I'll maybe say a little bit about later, maybe, is um, for say, like, if you want to do like quantum information processing, the fact that molecules or quantum -y stuff in general, the fact that molecules have permanent dipole moments with, which interact with each other very strongly is interesting. You know, atoms don't have that. They do in Rydberg states, um, but at least in their ground state, um, they don't. But, uh, but yeah, good question. I think <clears throat> there's also some, you know, later when I talk about some of the th things that are going on in the field, um, these additional degrees of freedom give you a lot of ability to kind of tune the properties of the species. And so with atoms, you kind of, you, you know, there are only so many atoms, um, but there are a lot more molecules, but also these additional degrees of freedoms in molecules give you a lot more ability to sort of tune them in situ to do something interesting. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that's why. 
<clears throat> and it's fun. Molecules are fun. That's the, that's the real reason <clears throat> that I work with them. Yeah. But yeah, most pe in like the sort of AMO experiment community, it's still mostly atoms. Adam, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Any any other any other questions? All right. So um, now, um, oh, there was a there should be a slide right there that I think I accidentally deleted, but I'll uh, I'll bring it back here. Um, I don't know what happened to it. I think I just accidentally deleted it. So I'll, I'll remake it really quickly. Just because it's, uh, I don't know. Don't, don't look at that. That's giving away the, you know, some, some stuff. Um, there we go. Yeah, so, all right, so there we go. <clears throat> so I made this great diagram. You see why I wanted to bring it back? Because it's so, you know, it's so colorful. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the, uh, the different structures that are present in molecules and their energy scales <clears throat> in terms of frequency, which is the, you know, my favorite unit of energy. Um, you know, on the high end, you have electronic and then vibration and then rotation. Then you have a bunch of sort of small things, which are also very species dependent, like hyperfine and spin rotation and parity doubling and some other things that I will talk about. Um, and uh, what we're going to do, there was previously there was a nice animation showing this, but I'll just describe it because I deleted the slide. Um, we're going to start up here and basically go down and just figure out like, okay, if you want to uh, cycle photons, if you want to engineer an optical cycling center in a molecule, you know, what do you need to do? We talked about that electronic vibrational decoupling thing, but is that it? And it turns out the answer is no, that's not it. Um, but that's kind of the hardest part in some sense. So uh, march down the structure this way and discuss um, <clears throat> the branching of some initial state into a final state. By branching, I just mean if you have some excited state, what are the different decay pathways where it could end up? Like where could it branch into when it decays? What are the branching ratios? You know, the fraction of time it goes here versus here versus here. <clears throat> OK, so um, first the electronic, you know, the highest energy. That one is, <clears throat> in some sense, most of the time, is easy. Just choose the lowest electronic excited state, because then it has nowhere else to go but the ground state when it decays. Great. Um, uh, for many such species, um, there's this pi state, which is the lowest energy state. And it turns out that the ground sigma to lowest excited pi state um, <clears throat> is really nice for photon cycling for a number of reasons. And uh, for calcium, strontium, and radium fluoride, it's the, it's the lowest energy excited state. So great, just use that. Um, for some of these, like yttrium oxide. So yttrium oxide is sort of chemically identical to like an alkaline earth fluoride. You know, yttrium is one to the right from the alkaline earths, and oxygen is one to the left. Um, so yttrium oxide has basically the same structure as, say, like calcium fluoride, but with this catch that it has a sort of intruder state uh, a delta state below this pi state. Um, and so <clears throat> you get some electronic leakage to this unwanted state, but it turns out that it's very small. And so you can basically just add a laser to repump it and it's fine. So, okay, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the electronic branching is solved. Choose the lowest electronic excited state. Um, <clears throat> uh, the vibrational branching is the hardest one um, because there are a lot of them in every state, uh, and there are no selection rules. <clears throat> um, luckily, we've already kind of talked about uh, how to solve this, but now I'm just going to revisit it in a slightly more quantitative way. <clears throat> Each electronic state has some potential energy surface, and the, the, the potential energy surface uh, supports the vibrational uh, modes, say for like a you know, diatomic. You get some vibrational wave functions that exist in this potential energy surface which are the vibrational uh, wave functions of the nuclei. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in the Born, Oppen, what's called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, um, because the electron motion, the electron energy scales are much higher than the vibrational energy scales, or in other words, the time scale of the electronic motion is much faster than the time scale of the vibrational motion, the electronic, when, you, when the molecule changes electronic state, 
it's basically instantaneous as far as the nuclei are concerned. Like they're vibrating in some electronic state and then just instantaneously the electron goes to some other state and it keeps vibrating but in this new potential now. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of you know, the quantum mechanics classes would call this like an instantaneous perturbation. You don't change the wave function, you just instantaneously change the Hamiltonian or the, you know, the potential energy. <clears throat> Uh, and so what that means is, if you review your instantaneous perturbations, you basically take the old wave function and you, well, the wave function doesn't change, so you just re, you project that wave function into the new basis. So if you started here, if I was in this state, say I excited to this state with a laser, and then after 20 nanoseconds it decays, it will decay into each of these states with a probability given by the overlap of the wave function, the vibrational wave functions. So basically take this, calculate the overlap integrals with all of these, square it, and if everything is properly normalized, um, that gives you the probability <coughs> of the uh, vibrational state changing upon decay. Um, those are called the Frank Condon factors, or FCFs. I have a question. So I haven't really seen anything like this before since, you know, the first time yesterday. So you want <coughs> the first excited electronic state. And so you have a new potential energy surface. Right. And so then the nuclei are switching between those. And then you can describe right. that state as like a linear combination of those. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, this, so this is um, the distance, if you just think of it as a diatomic. This is the energy... Uh, the electronic energy as a function of, of the nuclear separation. Right? So when you get really close, they repel each other because of the just Coulomb interaction between the nuclei, so it goes up. When, you, when they're infinitely far apart, it asymptotes to just you know, zero. There's no interaction. But then you know, there's a minimum because of, you know, chemical, because of chemistry. You know, it's a chemical bond, um, at least if it's a bound molecule. At some particular distance, it's energetically favorable for them to be you know, bound. Uh, bonded, um, <clears throat> and so you get some minimum. Um, but because this is an electronic energy, in a sense, um, when you change the electron wave function, you change its shape, you change how it interacts with the nuclei, so you'll change the shape of its potential. And in this case, this one is way up higher than this one because this corresponds to, for example, the electron in an excited state. So the overall energy goes up by like the electronic excitation energy. Um, <clears throat> but then you also change the shape of the potential. And because you know, these, the uh, eigenstates of each of these potentials forms you know, a complete basis, not almost. Um, <clears throat> they're continuum states. But uh, you can take this and sort of reproject it on all of these. And you can write this wave function as a linear combination of all of these. And then the relative intensities of those different combinations gives you the probability of when this starts up here and decays, where is it going to end up? Yeah. <clears throat> And those are the, the Frank Condon factors. Any any other questions? Ah, this is what I mean by diagonal. If you make um, just a table of ground state vibrational levels and excited state vibrational levels, and then you just plot, like, if I start here, what's the probability of going down to one of these? And you just make an array, um, then it's, you know, it's a matrix, it's a table, um, it's an array, the Frank Condon array. Um, <clears throat> and if this, and you would like this to be diagonal, meaning that if you start in V equals whatever, you will always end up in V equals the same thing when you decay. Um, that's never, ide so ideally it would, this would be an actual diagonal array and it would be a perfectly diagonal, we'd say it's a diagonal transition. That's never actually the case. Um, but for something like calcium fluoride, you can see it's, especially for the low levels, it's actually relatively diagonal. There's still some probability that these other, that it'll leak to an excited state, but it's low. Wait, so if you <clears throat> go back to the previous slide, it's, it's uh, like saying you're going from V1 to V1 would be like a diagonal. Well, yeah, so V, yeah, V, yeah, V to V, the same right. V, yeah, yeah, the same v, v equals one. So like V equals, if I'm in V equals zero, a diagonal, diagonal would mean I decay to V equals zero. Off diagonal would be I go somewhere else. And <clears throat> yeah. And it's just based on sort of the shape of this table. So is that yeah. saying that like that's good because 
if you're in a different electronic excited state, then even if you switch between the two, you'll always stay in the same vibrational state. Right, and the reason, exactly, and the reason that that's like good is because this is, this is, oh, that's, this is probabilistic. Like if you knew like where it was gonna decay, you wouldn't really care, but it's probabilistic. So you sort of add you know, entropy and uncertainty if you, because you don't know where it's gonna go. But if it's purely diagonal, you're not adding any sort of uncertainty in the internal state of the molecule when you cycle photons from it. And so that's good for these applications. Uh, when we talk about the decay, uh, do we also say that uh, it has to be at the same nuclear geometry or it changes? So in, so in the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is that uh, in some sense the sort of the nuclear position if you just think of it as like classically like a you know vibrating spring, uh, it would be that the the geometry of the nuclei does not change when the electronic state occurs. It's just that the sort of the potential. It would be like if you if you had your classical spring and you just like instantaneously change the spring constant. You don't move the masses, but now the spring constant is different, and so it's going to start vibrating in a different way. Unless you don't change it. So another way to interpret this is like, did you change the spring constant and did you change the displacement? If you didn't, nothing happens. But if you do, if you change either one of those, you kind of, you'll kick the oscillator and it will start vibrating in a different way. Is that, is that what, you, does that address your question? Uh, I was also thinking if, uh, if there's a decay and let's say it happens from the maxima of uh, <laughs> V prime zero, or does it happen from like any uh, point on that plot? Yeah, well, so I guess I would interpret it as it, it, it happens from sort of all of these things at the same time. Like if the molecule is in this eigenstate, it doesn't really have a sort of single well-defined nuclear separation as you know, a wave function describing some distribution of separations governed by this. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, so diagonal. Um, we love diagonal molecules and diagonal transitions, and we try to find as diagonal ones as they can. So earlier what I was saying about aluminum fluoride being like the most diagonal, if you made this chart for aluminum fluoride, the diagonal would be even more closer, close to one, and the off-diagonal things would be even less than, you know, closer to zero. Um, I don't think I have, I don't have any of those for only, I only have it for this molecule, but um, yeah, and then just relating it to this kind of, uh, just going back to this potential energy surface thing and the what is a diagonal versus non-diagonal. So here's an example of, so most molecules, by the way, are not diagonal. Most molecules, if they undergo some electronic decay, they just spread the vibration kind of all over the place. Um, <clears throat> lithium hydride is an example uh, of a not diagonal molecule. The ground state potential energy surface looks like this. The excited state one looks very different. And so if you're in, say, the V equals zero state, which is this green one, and then you look at what do the vibrational states in this potential look like? It's like they're very offset. They have very different curvatures because they have a very different, a very different spring constant. Um, these kind of overlap with everything, and so then what's the probability of the zero state up here decaying to, you know, some state down here? It just looks like this. It's a big giant distribution, which you'll notice spans, you know, hundreds of nanometers. So uh, <clears throat> that would be hard, hard to do anything with that. Um, but calcium fluoride, um, I didn't even bother drawing the ground and excited potential energy surfaces because they basically look the same. Um, now if you look at the wave functions and the ground and excited state, they're, they're very similar. They're a little displaced and slightly different curvature, but they, they overlap very well. And so now you get something that looks like this. You know, now this is on a log scale. Um, you get something like 98% here and then like, oh, here you go. These numbers are a little off, but whatever, you know. 97-ish percent here, 3%, and then you can see there's kind of like an exponential suppression of going to higher and higher levels. So um, with just a few lasers, like if you have just a laser sort of here and here and here, you can address uh, all of the states that you need to in the sort of part to 10 to the minus four, yeah. What does the width of, the, of this potential? What do you, what, sorry, can, what the do you? The width, yeah, just like, because you have the width of the wave functions that depends on the width of the Morse potential, I guess, and. It, de it depends on the curvature. It doesn't depend on the, the, 
well, I guess, the, okay, the curvature, and it depends, the, the size of this, say this wave function or this wave function, like the ground, you know, sort of Gaussian state is determined only by the curvature here because it's harmonic. Um, it's related for a Morse potential. There's some relationship between the curvature here and the width here, which I, I don't remember what that is. But, but yeah, because especially for these, you'll notice that these are, well, okay, maybe not this one, <clears throat> but for a, a lot of the molecules that I'll be talking about, you're always working in the sort of the lowest few levels where it, it looks typically very harmonic. Um, <clears throat> and so you don't have to worry about the sort of overall shape of the potential because even actually you can see that here. Once you start getting high up the potential, and it starts becoming anharmonic. Um, the probability that the wave functions overlap, you know, exactly starts to go down. So these things, as you go to higher vibrational level, um, you get out of the harmonic part of the potential. Uh, they kind of always get sort of messy. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, then, yeah, it, it does. But uh, then I have another question, the follow-up question: What does the curvature <laughs> correspond to? Because uh, one of them is narrow and the other one is more flat. So what is exactly the mechanism there? For th for this one, that's a great question. I don't really know. Because um, I don't know much about lithium hydride. Um, like in terms of is there a good, is there a good intuitive understanding in this case uh, why there's, so maybe I couldn't say why in, in a hand wavy way why one is sort of pointier and the other one is not. But I would say because in lithium hydride, this, the electron that you're exciting is in the chemical bond. So when you excite that electron, you change the potential energy surface a lot. Like why it gets flatter instead of sharper, that I don't, I'm sure there's, there's probably some good reason why, but I don't know why, other than just it changes a lot. Isn't it related to the force constant, right? So Sure. And that's it. I mean, it's the, it's the, as yeah. you said, it's the curvature. Yeah. So we go, you know, we talk about the half of potentials in molecular stuff. We've got mm. very shallow mm. energy surfaces, and so you've got really broad, not defined mm. vibrational states. And so it's the opposite, I guess, here. We're yeah. Very well defined in the ground state, right? Very <clears throat> right. Bonding regime. And when you excite it and you've, you've taken the electron out of the bond, it's no longer so strongly bound, and so the force constant is lower. It's a bit more shallow, would be my guess. Mm. Yeah, but it's because it's weird, right? Because it's not even like. More shallow, it's sort of less. Cur it's more curvy. I don't know, but yeah. The nature of the bond change. Right. On excited state. So yeah. in this case, it's just a weaker bond on the excited state, and that's, that's right. the manifestation. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the nature of the atomic orbitals that participate in the bond in the first place. So we need the diagram to really justify this. But that's the origin. Mm -hmm. So then, so for sorry, for the calcium fluoride, you have pretty similar bond uh, strength in both excited and ground states. Right, yeah, and that's because in something like calcium fluoride, the electron that you're exciting is not involved in the chemical bond. For lithium hydride, it is, and I think that's why it changes. So, like, again, you know, why it gets, why the shape change, I think that's a good, you know, why does it get shallower? Because it's a weaker bond. Um, but I think just in general, you expect it to change a lot because the electron, you know, the bond, the properties of the bond are set, you know, by the electrons. And you're changing the state of the electron involved in the bond. So you expect the bond to change a lot, and therefore the potential energy surface to change a lot. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, in terms of, you know, does it get shallower or deeper or whatever, it would depend on the molecule and the states involved. And because you could imagine a state of something where like this is the ground state and this is the excited state, you know, and then it would still be bad. Um, but then something like calcium fluoride, these basically look the same, except just slightly shifted, yeah, and slightly. Squashed, yeah. Uh, are the transition probabilities off due to representation, or is there a reason they're not exactly normalized? Because if they're experimentally off, I would expect them to be less than unity rather than larger. Right, yeah, yeah, no, this, I think, <clears throat> I assume it was that the, this, that, that Mike Tarbot just, you know, rounded these things. Uh, yeah, so this is, there are some digits after these. I think he just rounded up for simplicity, but yeah, these don't, these add up to, 1.1% or 100.1%, which is above 100. But that's just, you know, rounding for the sake of a nice figure for a review article. But I have some, later I have some tables that have some like digits in them and stuff. Yeah. Do you have the transition matrix for aluminum fluoride? Not in, not in here, but uh, I could help you find it because um, it's, it's out there. Yeah. 
And actually, you know, the homework is to basically compute these yourself. Because um, uh, for diatomics, at least, um, in the harmonic approximation, you can just calculate using, you know, harmonic oscillator math. You can calculate Frank Condon factors as long as you know these molecular constants. But you can look them up for lots of stuff. You can definitely look them up for calcium fluoride. You can look them up, look them up for aluminum fluoride. Um, and because the harmonic description is so valid, you can get basically this, you know, you can, you can get to essentially the state of the art uncertainty using ab initio methods because it's just so harmonic. Um, yeah. But it's like 99 point something percent for aluminum fluoride and maybe even 99.9. .9. But yeah, I don't, I don't have any of those numbers in here. <clears throat> yeah, so just as a um, sort of a technical aside, um, the Frank Condon factor gives the wave function overlap, but the, what you actually care about is like what's the, you know, the probability of decaying here versus here versus here um, also depends on the rates of decay. Um, and the rates have this sort of wavelength cubed weighting. So like for example, if you had some uh, unusual situation where one of these vibrational states was like above this one, you'd never actually get decays up there. Um, uh, <clears throat> and so you have to, you weight the Frank Condon factors by the cube of the transition energy to get the actual, you know, vibrational branching ratios. Um, however, these things are almost always very, they almost always differ by like theoretical and experimental uncertainties. Um, for these diagonal molecules, so people often just conflate them and just don't, people just talk about the Frank Condon factors when they should say the vibrational branching ratios. Because, and so here's a table with some numbers that I presume add up to less than one showing the Frank Condon factors and the vibrational branching ratios. You can see they're, they're basically the same. Um, so uh, I'll just, I won't be careful about distinguishing the, the terminology there. <clears throat> Right, so just to kind of, to circle back in these types of molecules and to, con and to connect to the, the earlier discussion, when you have these sort of, these like S plus P sigma hybridized molecules, it pushes the electron away from the bond, it decouples the electronic and molecular degrees of freedom. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think, yeah, I, actually I think I, I think I said these already. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and so, um, and uh, again, if you look at these things sort of uh, with ab initio, proper ab initio methods or even sort of approximate methods, um, you know, you find that, that you, this sort of unique picture of the ligand field polarizing the electron away is kind of, it's a very unique, it's a fairly unique feature of these molecules um, <clears throat> and leads to this sort of peak potential energy surface in the ground and excited state being uh, essentially the same. <clears throat> Any, so we're now going to we're going to keep going down unless people have questions about about these. I'm gonna, otherwise, I'm going to kind of move away from these and talk about these now. But we can always come back, or you can ask me later. You know. um, <clears throat> uh, right? Oh yeah. So for electronic, use a low lying excited state. For vibration, find a species where the valence electron is polarized away from the bond. Um, great. So now, what about these? Um, so I'll have to say a little bit about some of the, the details of the molecular structure, um, <clears throat> at least for these types, for these simple molecules, um, which fortunately, again, we can sort of compactly discuss uh, all of their features down to the sort of single quantum level, which is, which is handy. Um, so you have this, the electronic state, which uh, I said earlier was this doublet sigma state. By the way, things which aren't a doublet sigma will look completely different from what I'm about to draw. This is really just for these like doublet sigma molecules. Uh, <clears throat> each, the electronic state is split into a ladder of vibrational states, spaced for these types of molecules by typically about 10 megahertz or a few hundred wave numbers or like 30 microns. Um, <clears throat> uh, then each of those vibrational states has a ladder of rotational states, like end over end rigid rotor rotational states. Um, these are all, these are, for, these are fairly generic. These structures kind of ex exist in everything. Now where it starts getting a little specific is <clears throat> um, you get something called spin rotation splitting where this electron, which has a magnetic moment, interacts with this rotating charged ligand. 
which makes a magnetic field as it rotates and interacts with this magnetic moment. And so you get a splitting um, between and the rotational quantum number and the spin. So basically, whether the spin is sort of aligned or anti-aligned with the rotation, you get a different, uh, a physically distinct state with some energy splitting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so that's called spin rotation splitting. That gives you a quantum number that we call J, which is a combination of N, the rotation, and S, the spin. Um, <clears throat> and then you get hyperfine splitting, which is the, arises from the fact that the electron magnetic moment and the nuclear magnetic moment on the ligand, which doesn't always have to be there, but is there for like fluorine. Fluorine has one. Um, those interact with each other. And then the relative orientation of the spin one half electron and the spin one half fluorine nucleus split each of these into two states, which we label F. Um, <clears throat> don't worry about all this. Um, I, we can revisit it if you forget. But I think the, <clears throat> the takeaway is um, largely that we can actually, we can sort of ignore this part. So I brought it up just so that I convinced you we could ignore it. And the reason, there are kind of two reasons why we can ignore this. Um, First of all, there are only a few levels here. Like there, this, all of this structure splits it into four levels, which is a finite number, as opposed to like rotation and vibration where there's kind of many, many, many states. For this stuff, there's only four for this type of molecule. So it's, it's bounded. Um, <clears throat> but also, the energy scales here are sort of tens to maybe hundreds of megahertz. And it turns out that just experimentally, it's very easy to take a laser and add frequency components at tens and hundreds of megahertz splittings. Um, <clears throat> so you can essentially ignore this. Of course, there are some subtleties that come into play if you actually try to do this in the lab, but like, eh, they're solvable. So laser, you can modulate your laser to address this structure sort of fully. Um, you can take a laser, it's fairly straightforward to take a laser and split it into several frequency components spaced by up to like a few gigahertz using things like acousto-optical frequency shifters or, or AOMs and electro-optical phase modulators, or EOMs. Um, so for example, for strontium fluoride, you want to address these sort of, the black lines indicate the sort of molecular lines you want to address. These red lines indicate what you get if you take a laser and do a single pass through an electro-optical modulator. And you can see like, ah, they basically overlap. So good enough. Um, you can do fancy sort of frequency synthesis with like really fast EOMs, or you can sort of daisy chain EOMs to address more complicated structures. <clears throat> but the takeaway is that even with, even with complex species where there are multiple nuclear spins, so there are actually multiple levels of hyperfine splitting because they're relatively small and a finite number, you can basically split your laser to address them all at once. So you don't have to get a separate laser for each transition. You can take one laser and just address all of them at once. So, <clears throat> yeah. So the, the point of that is that you can address your entire population <clears throat> whatever gas cell you've got rather than the subpopulation that happens to exist in a specific line that you've got access to. Yeah, or, or even worse, um, you know, when I, for, for branching, right, when you have an excited state decay, it can go to some unwanted vibrational level. It can also go to an unwanted hyperfine level. And so if you only have a laser, if I'm only addressing like this state, um, it turns out that the probability of ending up in like one of these other states is like order unity. So like if I only have a laser here, I'll, I'll get to scatter like one or two photons before I end up here or here. Um, and so it's like, okay, well, I need another laser here then. It's like, well, you also need another laser here and another laser here. Like if you want to cycle photons because they basically populate these states randomly in the photon cycling, you have to address them all. Um, but it's, it's easy to do that because you can just take your laser and split it so that you address all of these at once. For these, it's harder um, to do that. So that's kind of that's sort of the point is that you don't have to worry about this level of detail because you can just like experimentally make it go away. So if it <clears throat> decays into a state that's like f one zero over two or whatever, you don't need to know which one it's in. You can take your laser. Right. You just shoot them all. Yeah, just shoot them all in at once. Right. You yeah. know, it's, it's in one of those. You it's just in one of those. Yeah. Excite it back to whatever. You right. Need to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. That's kind of experimentally solved. It turns out, and I won't talk about this, but it turns out it's actually nothing ever works. Like that's the, that's like the experimentalist's creed. Nothing ever works. In terms of, so that works, you can do that, but then you get things, actually we'll talk about it a little bit later. It turns out you can get like interferences between the lasers that cancel out the transitions and it's like, you know, which is like, that's what we do all day is 
solve those types of problems. But um, basically, there you can just make it go away. In most cases, there are some cases where you can't. Um, but you know, we won't talk about those because it's depressing. <laughs> yeah. Just a question about the set industry. Uh, how mature are the tools you have available on the market versus, uh, or do you need some optical physicists on the team uh, to sort of help K out? <laughs> That's a great question. And uh, it sounds like a sort of facetious answer, but it's, it depends how much money you have. Because you can buy you can buy lasers that will do anything. Like there are companies where you can just call them up and say, like, I want a laser that does this, and they will send it to you. And but it will cost a lot of money. Um, you can put it together. Then there are varying degrees of build it yourself or put it together by yourself. But then you stray into the realm of like, well, you kind of need someone who knows like really how lasers work, like really how they work. Um, so like, like in my group, for example, we're fortunate that we have someone like that in the group who's like a, a semi-retired molecular spectroscopist named Tim Steinle, um, who's really good at like lasers, and he helps us keep our like army of lasers up and running. That um, just because like we, you know, you can't for these types of experiments. I think nobody can afford to buy a new laser for every single laser you need. It would be it would just be like it would. It'd be like ten million dollars of just like lasers. It's like um, <clears throat> so. Uh, so we have some combination of like realistic. We have some of these like new fancy lasers, but we also have we have we literally have lasers that were built in the seventies that we bought off eBay for like a couple hundred dollars, and like we kind of have everything in between. And I think that's not unique to my lab. I think a lot of labs that do like this kind of molecule stuff are kind of in a similar boat, where you have some like state of the art fancy lasers. And some like old junk that you found in a closet covered with dust and fixed up. But if any of you have very wealthy relatives, <laughs> just remember how great this talk was and you know, give me ten million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> great question. Good good practical question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so you can basically make these go away. So I won't talk about them really anymore. Um, <clears throat> one which is so okay. So those are those are gone. Forget those. So, but rotation is left. I didn't block that one out because they're kind of neither of these really apply to rotation um, because you know first of all there's a bunch of rotational states um, and second of all the splitting between them at least for these types of molecules is typically like tens of gigahertz or or you know even up to 100 gigahertz. And that, it turns out, is kind of hard to bridge by just modulating your laser. And so um, <clears throat> you have some selection rules you can use, but you still, here's just an example of, of kind of why you have to be careful. It's like, let's say you tried, let's say I drove this transition, like a sort of zero to one rotational quanta transition. Well, the selection rules for, rotation, for electronic decays is you have to change the parity. You know, rotational states alternate between parity as you go up the ladder. And you can't change the rotational quantum by more than one. So okay, if I if I excited this transition, I could get decays back down to this state. It's like okay, fine. That's just one more state. I'll just add a laser and I'll repump it to this state. It's like well, but now two to three, three can decay to four, et cetera. So if you just sort of if you choose your scheme at random, you may populate sort of a well, not an infinite, but a very large number of very far apart levels. So um, plugging a one leak can add more leak. Um, so, you know, the solution is don't do this. Um, there are tricks you can play with selection rules um, that lead to rotationally closed transitions, meaning transitions where you don't get unwanted rotational branching. And uh, that, you know, simply is choose a state where you go from one to zero. So if you have one, one quantum of rotation here and zero up in this electronic excited state, um, <clears throat> We're here, I'm just, you know, this is just sort of generic rotational quantum number. Um, and then you look at what are the, like, where could it possibly end up uh, when it decays? Like, well, it can't go here because it's the same parity. It can't go here because it's the same parity. It can't go here because that would change the rotational quantum by more than one. So you can only go back down to here. So if you drive this kind of transition, you can basically ignore the rotational branching too. Um, <clears throat> 
And this it turns out this is, this is what people do. If you drive this type of transition in these types of molecules with those types of laser modulators to bridge the fine structure and hyperfine, you can, you can cycle a lot of photons. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, nothing ever works. So if you tried to do this, it wouldn't work because, um, oh yeah, so you have zero to one is the only decay allowed uh, to good approximation. You can have like higher multipole terms or something, but those, they turn out to be very small. Um, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, these schemes generically exist. Like this is a sort of rigid, you know, non-realistic rigid rotor spectrum. But if you look at like real molecular structures um, for different types of transitions, you can always find uh, transitions like this where you need, you know, maybe a few, but sort of a finite number of, of lasers um, to plug the rotational leakage. <clears throat> um, and it turns out this is also true. These are all diatomics. If polyatomics, nonlinear ones are more complicated because they have more rotational degrees of freedom. You know, they have multiple moments of inertia. But it turns, and well, that's actually sort of an unsolved problem to a large extent. But you'll notice the, they all have this sort of feature like this that they have a larger angular momentum in their ground state than their excited state. <clears throat> and uh, as soon as you point that out uh, to someone who like shoots lasers at atoms molecules, they get very sad because there's a problem when you do that, which is dark states. <clears throat> um, Whenever you have more angular momentum in the ground state than the excited states, there are always dark states, meaning um, there are states that can't scatter laser light of some given polarization. And so in, in, uh, the sort of like a simple example of this is if you go from like j equals 1 to j equals 0, um, <clears throat> and I, I haven't discussed like selection rules for polarized light or anything, so if, if you don't know what they are, don't worry, because uh, you, you just trust me. If you scatter, say, circularly polarized light, you have to increase the m quantum number by one or decrease it by one, depending on the polarization. So if I'm in this state and I shine light with this polarization that would have to increase m by one, I can't. There's no state that, there's no excited state to couple to. Uh, so the light just passes right through the molecules and doesn't do anything. Um, so that's bad because the whole point was to like cycle photons. Um, <clears throat> and same with, you know, the, uh, there's uh, an opposite polarization. There's some other state that's dark. And it, these generically exist whenever you, they don't, if you have more angular momentum in the excited state, you don't have this problem. But whenever you have the same or less, you always have this problem. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so that's bad because you stop scattering photons. Um, there are several ways to deal with this problem. Um, one is, for example, you can rapidly switch the polarization of your laser um, between, you know, the two different handedness of circular, circular polarization. Um, so that if you're in a dark state, you just wait a little bit, and then you'll be in a bright state because you'll shoot a different polarization at it. Um, but you can also, you know, if you're really curious, read these reviews because it turned uh, or this this review because it's actually very complicated. Um, but I'll just mention uh, uh, one example. So this is something that is commonly done: this sort of rapidly alternating. Um, <clears throat> so you can rapidly alternate. Uh, your laser polarization, and if you're doing some like magnetic field sensitive thing like magneto optical trapping, which I'll talk about later, you can also alternate, for example, the magnetic field at the same frequency, um, which you can do by, for example, building like in vacuum resonant magnetic coils to broadcast like megahertz uh, micro uh, magnetic fields. Yeah. Is it known that, like, for a general rotate, general like non written non single body rigid rotor is it known that there is a rotational closure like that you like has it been proven that you can close it to rotations like or is there is there a chance that there may not be a, any transition that truly lets you close it and that you always will end up with the distribution of all the different rotations yeah i think for <clears throat> um i think if you ignore fine and hyperfine structure you can always find them but um, even for calcium fluoride, um, the rotational transitions aren't perfectly closed because the hyperfine interaction with the fluorine actually mixes in some other like rotational states. But it's very small, and so it's basically negligible. Okay, so um, basically within the limit of only considering rotational and not considering any other right. crazy data, that, that even asymmetric tops could be closed to rotation. <clears throat> Right, although yes, <laughs> asymmetric tops are, 
are tricky, but I think strictly speaking, yes, if you sort of ignore these like higher order effects, it's you can find things that are strictly closed. The catch is that um, you know, J is not a good quantum number. The good quantum number is F. Um, or I guess another way to think about it is um, the rotation and the other degrees of freedom are coupled. And so this trick of like, oh, go from like one to zero rotational quanta, um, you can't just address the rotational quanta in the molecule because they're all actually coupled with each other. And so when you address the rotational level, you're actually also addressing the, the spin, the electron spin and the nuclear spin because they're all coupled. And so you may get some sort of unwanted kind of excitation where the, you know, the excitation kind of hops from the rotational to the hyperfine or something. Um, and so, like that's called like hyperfine induced transitions, for example. And they're, they're usually very small. Um, in one of the molecules we work with, YBOH, it's sort of anomalously large in that it's like sort of one or two percent. But um, it's, those are just kind of generally negligible. Yeah, you will get leakage to like higher rotational levels, even with something like calcium. Because chlorine. your trivium has like a really big, like, uh, hyperfine constant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's gigantic. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> Quick terminology question. What is the rotational closure? Oh, rotational closure means um, sort of <laughs> rotationally diagonal to relate it to other jargon. Um, I just mean by rotational closure, I mean if I excite to this rotational state, I decay back down to a known rotational state every time, as opposed to something like this, where it's like sometimes I'll decay down here, sometimes I'll, I'll decay down here. I don't have closure rotational, and we all want closure. Um, but if I drive this transition, it's closed because it always decays back down to this state, at least to good approximation. So the rotational wave functions overlap like very, like very much. You know, so you have like. Actually they, don't, actually, they don't overlap very much at all. But um, How do you get a diagonal? because the, a way to think about it is um, the photon has one unit of angular momentum. It has a spin. It has a spin one. It's a spin one particle. <clears throat> and uh, so when that's sort of, that's kind of the intuitive reason why you get these like selection rules with rotation. Because like the photon has one unit of angular momentum, I can't add two units of angular momentum with one photon. I mean, you actually can, but like it's very, it's very unlikely. Um, and so I wouldn't think of it as, um, I wouldn't think of it as like wave function overlap because these these rotational wave functions actually don't overlap much at all. But if you sort of take this rotational wave function and add like a, the angular momentum from a photon to it, then it overlaps with this one. But it's a little, it's different than the Frank Condon factor because it's not, um, you're not just sort of like reprojecting like one basis onto the other basis. You're actually using this interaction with an external field to like change properties of the state. Yeah. Uh, just as a clarification, when you say it's possible to add two years of angular momentum with one photon, that's related to not having a photon due to the accuracy of a single photon source, right? <clears throat> no, that would that would mean um, that would mean uh, higher order multipoles that you can drive with a single photon that would rely on the like gradient of the electromagnetic radiation over the size of the molecule. That's what I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, a quick question about the uh, rotation. Because so I understand that the Boltzmann population of the higher line rotational states are usually not small. And then as you cool the system, you also will change that population. Would that affect how you pump and prevent these additional leaks? Very much so, and in a very po strictly positive way. And I'll, I'll, kinda, I'll talk about that later. Um, I'll talk about like sort of experimental, experimental methods. And yeah, for at least for gas phase things, you kind of always want them to be cold. And you want them to be cold, cold meaning a few Kelvin, because if they're a few Kelvin, you collapse the population into like a few rotational states. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because this, this, in some sense, this like one to zero trick um, really only works for the lowest state. Like this doesn't exist for three, because if I do like three to two, you know, well two uh, could go to one, you know, or five. So this, you really only get this for this low-lying state. And so um, 
it, you just want to concentrate as much population in this like one rotational state as you can. And one easy way to do that is just make it as cold as you, as you can. Yeah. And I think it's, it's probably about time for a break. All right. But uh, I'll be here. I'm giving the next one too, so.